When I tell people that I spent a night in jail, they uh, step back and they say, what were you doing in jail? Well, I got to tell you, it's very, very important to know what you are doing in a place that you go to. What you do really matters. So, you're in church here today, and um, after you go home, you may meet somebody that has never been in church. And you tell them, well, I spent some time in church today. And they say, what were you doing in church? I'll tell you what I was doing in jail. I went to jail to sleep. If I went to jail to do time for a crime, that would be very different than going to jail to sleep. I was hitchhiking a thousand miles from Pretoria to Heldeberg College. Student, always broke. I used to average hitchhiking that thousand miles with about 20 hours, maybe 24 at the most. This time it took me two days. Bad luck, not enough rides. I was so tired, totally broke, no place to go and sleep. So I went to the police station and I said, Sir, uh, do you have a place for me to sleep? Yeah, sure. Took me to the cell, locked me in, and I slept. I slept good. Problem is, the warden didn't tell the next warden who came on the shift change <laughs> that um, he was meant to open up that door at 6 o'clock in the next morning. Well, you can see, it's harder to get out than to get in. <laughs> but I'm out, as you can see. Jail met my need for sleep. What is the need that brought you here today? Maybe for sleep, and that's fine. You can do that. The deacons will wake you up when it's all over. What is the need that has brought you here? Now, you may hear it said that when you come to worship, it's not about your needs. That worship is not about you having your personal needs met. Worship is exclusively about praising God. That's what you may hear. Now, if that is true, then I'd like to know how to explain Psalm 18, verse 1 to 3, which says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I called on the Lord. Finish it for me. Who is worthy of praise? If in this passage your needs are not considered and you only are meant to praise God and it's got nothing to do with your needs, then this passage will read something like, I love you, Lord. You are strong. The Lord is the rock, the fortress, and the Savior. That's the same text. What's missing? You are missing. Your needs are missing. And God's purpose in Scripture is to mingle, to mix our needs with our praising Him. The only difference is that Scripture does not, does not fix our attention on our needs. It fixes our attention on praising God. It's absolutely true that authentic worship will meet your needs. Authentic worship will meet your needs. The purpose, of course, of worship is not there for, for us to concentrate or just focus on our needs. That's what happens all week long. All week long, this culture of ours, this consumer culture of ours, is defining our needs. And then it is urging us constantly to seek fulfillment of our needs in a selfish way. That's all week long. The church's role is not to meet all and sundry needs that we have. The church's role is to show that we have some deeper needs 
The real needs we have are deeper than the needs that our consumer culture is making us aware of all week long. We have deeper needs. And those deeper needs come to the surface when we praise God. The more we focus on God and who He is and what He has done for us, the more we become aware of our sinfulness, which is a deeper need, the more we become aware of His gift of repentance where we turn from our wrongs, the more we receive the good news of the gospel. Those are our deeper needs that come out as we focus on worshiping God. And when we do that and our deepest needs are met, guess what? We leave totally satisfied because worship is not about a search for meaning or fulfillment, but an acknowledgement that meaning and salvation are found in God's loving act of redemption in Christ. That's where our meaning is found. That's where our fulfillment is found. So then what about my needs? The more you let your deepest needs be met by focusing on praising God, the more you will be satisfied in every possible aspect of your life. Our problem is that we come with the immediate needs that are really on the surface more. And we want to concentrate on those things, then we miss out on the deepest needs, and we don't even get the surface ones met. So you get the most out of worship when you give God a lift in worship. Story of Elijah on Mount Carmel, first. Kings chapter 18 is exactly about God getting a lift out of worship, but it's also about a showdown between true and false worship. It's also a contest or a showdown between the true God and the false God. True worship, false worship. True God, false God, and it's always combined with the true gospel and the false gospel. That's pretty simple to remember. So here it is. In the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, Go present yourself to King Ahab. Tell him that I will soon send rain. Right now, today, it is considered by the experts that the worst drought in decades throughout the world is existing today in the Horn of Africa. Parts of Ethiopia, Somalia, and Kenya are in a severe beer drought where 12 million people are at risk. Those people have lost their farms, their produce, their cattle. They've lost everything. And when they carry their few possessions with them, walking for weeks to try and get an NG to an NGO camp in order to get some food, maybe some medicine, the militias accost them and take away even their possessions. They arrive at these camps totally hungry. Many of them have lost their children along the way. They've walked for three weeks or more. This is considered today the greatest humanitarian disaster in our world right now today. And in Israel, there was a similar drought, except this one went for three years. Israel. And the people of Israel realized that something is terribly wrong. Well, they were worshiping the God of Baal. And they believed that the God of Baal would give them water and that he'd somehow bring a solution. He was, after all, the God of the storms. Why not bring us rain? And they were praying and pleading, but nothing happened. And God allowed it to happen for three years. So they'll get convinced that the God that they have chosen is actually the God that will let them down. And when they were kind of getting to the point when that got through to their, into their skulls, that's when God said to Elijah, Okay, Elijah, it's time now. I want you to go and confront Ahab because they now see that Baal, their God, has let them down. Elijah gets to the place where he finds Ahab and Jezebel, and now comes a contest. What is going on here? The moment Ahab sees him, what do you do? Shift the blame. He's got all the problems of the state. He can't balance the budget. The deficit reduction thing is not working, and everything is going into the pits, and everyone's terrified, and the trouble is just mounting and mounting. And Ahab says to Elijah, You... 
It's really you that's causing all this trouble in Israel. Well, you know, we get a little defensive. And so this prophet said, ah, I've made no trouble for Israel, says Elijah, 1 Kings 18, 17, and 19. It's you and your family. A little bit of a blame game going on here, but here's where the real thing comes. He says, you've got to remember, Ahab, you refuse to obey God's commands. You worship the images of Baal instead. So here's the deal. Here's what, it, what we should do. You summon all the people of Israel, the prophets, and you yourself, and everybody. Come to the Mount Carmel, and there we will worship God. All 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asherah who are supported by Jezebel, come. Let's go and worship God. God, it's an amazing thing to call these people who are worshiping a pagan idol, to say, come and worship God. I said, well, okay, we'll go for that showdown. Carmel was considered a sacred place, Mount Carmel, just like a church is. And early in that morning, as the sun was coming up, the people were gathering up on the Mount Carmel. And they were excited. They were anticipating to get so much out of that worship service. They knew this was the day that their rain would come from the God of Baal. Everything was set. And the king comes up with his entourage, pomp and circumstance. And everybody is excited. They welcome the king and his entourage and all the princes. And everyone's so excited. The prophets come in there with all their regalia. And all these prophets are showing that they are ready to really make things perform today. And here's a little man walking with a stick, finding his way up the mountain. His name is Elijah. He comes to church as well. He knows there's a lot of bad stuff going on in church, but he's there anyway. And while everything is getting so very, very excited, I mean, it's so excited that, that Elijah must have wondered to himself, you know what? If excitement can bring rain, it's going to storm you at any moment. Nothing happens. Elijah is not into the spirit of what's happening there. He's rather into the Word. He's not catching on to the atmosphere that is electric, that is so thrilling, that is dazzling. He's not into that because the Spirit of God is in him. And there he sits. And it's time for the call to worship. And Elijah stood in front of them and he said, How much longer will you waver? Hobbling between two opinions. False worship, true worship. False God, true God. False gospel, true gospel. If God is God, follow Him. But if Baal is God, then follow Him. But the people were completely silent. Very awkward silence in church that day. And it turns into a test. Let me say this, friend. This test has a lot to do with what is going on in the world today. Watch. And Elijah said, all right, now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish, cut it into pieces, lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting it to fire, I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood of the altar, but not set fire to it. I won't set fire to it. And then call on the name of your God. They were God-focused, weren't they? except it was the wrong God. And I will call on the name of the Lord, Yahweh. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people said, Amen. They did. And they said it louder than you did. You know, Elijah makes fire the center of this worship service. And the reason for that is, is that fire in the Bible is a symbol of the presence of God. You remember Moses, that burning bush there, it wouldn't stop burning, and he had to take his shoes off his feet. It was the presence of God, that fire. Remember the cloud that led Israel through the desert for 40 years and more? At night it was a fiery cloud. During the day it was a shady cloud. That was the presence of the Lord. So the fire is central to this worship service because it's about the presence of God among His people. But it was also a symbol of Baal, the storm god. 
The ancient manuscripts show that the people believed that this god Baal, he would flash his lightning all over the place. He would create fire. He was a storm god. He was some god of fire. So here it is, the true fire and the false fire. But the fire in the Bible is also a symbol that represents the acceptance of the sacrifice. Hmm. The people put, the priests put a, a, an innocent lamb or a goat or a bull on the altar. The fire would come down and consume it, showing the acceptance of that sacrifice. And the people would also add to that a prayer. Lord, please help us in our daily needs. Give us rain. That's the big thing on their minds right then. Please send rain. That's the need that we have. But their deeper need, their deepest need was not rain. What was it? Think about the needs that you list to God in prayer. How long is that list compared to the deeper need? You see, this test about the true God and the false God, the true worship and the false worship, the true Holy Spirit and the false Holy Spirit, the true gospel and the false Holy that is all about our deeper need. And one day, the whole world is going to be a Mount Carmel. The whole world is going to be a test. Here it is. I saw another beast come up out of the earth. The earth here. He spoke with the voice of a dragon. He required all the earth and its people to what? Worship. There's the issue. The first beast. He did a astounding miracles. Sounds like the prophets of Baal on top of that Mount Carmel. Even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. He deserved, he deceived all the people who belong to the world. If you are alive on that day, my friends, you're going to be seeing something happening worldwide before Jesus comes and you will feel the pressure to worship like everyone else does. And the test will be about worship. You will feel like Elijah, very alone. And while all this happens, fire will once again be central to worship. The fire will come down. It says that in the Scripture. But this time the fire will fall on the wrong altar. Everyone will think it's the true altar, but it will be the wrong altar, as this passage says in Revelation. Elijah's day, it fell on the correct altar. Why is it not falling on the correct altar this time? Why is it on the false altar? Everyone thinks it's the true altar, and there you and I are standing. We think to ourselves, have we been wrong all the time? This thing looks so right, what's happening here. It is so convincing. Our perception is with our senses that this is the way to go. The whole world is going that way. And it looks so convincing. It is enough religion in it, enough Christianity in it, to make it look genuine. Our perception will deceive us. You've heard them say, perception is everything. Perception is also deception. We count on our senses, what we perceive, we will be led astray. So what's going on here? We were wrong all the time. What appears true is actually false. What's going on here is, there is a false gospel that has taken hold of the minds of the, of the world. It sounds very much like the true gospel, but it is not the true gospel. And let me say that that false fire can fall in any Adventist church because you hold certain doctrines and truths and you have a heritage of being an Adventist. It's not going to guarantee you against that deception. You could very well believe in the false fire. You'll actually think, well, this must be Elijah that's returned. It will not fall on the Lord's altar. It's going to fall on the false altar. 
So how will you keep from being deceived? So follow the story closely. 1 Kings 18, 26, he says, Then they called out the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. And then they danced and hobbling around the altar that they had made. You see, for six hours, these prophets performed an impressive thing for their God to be convinced about. They were offering to their God some performance which they hoped he would accept, which is the kernel error in the false gospel, presenting to God anything good, even religion, even worship, in order to get God to accept us. They missed their deeper need. It was all about their superficial need for rain. And in less than a minute, Elijah prayed to God Almighty and the fire came down. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up that young bull which was on God's altar, which Elijah chose, the wood, the stones, the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. This fire, friends, is not the fire of judgment or it would have consumed all those prophets. This fire is not the fire of excitement because if there was excitement that can bring fire down, it would have happened right then. In contrast to that excitement, there is this young man. Well, was he young at that time? Elijah, Bedrocks and King says, the calm demeanor of the prophet of God stands out in sharp contrast to the fanatical, senseless frenzy of the followers of Baal. There is a calmness that will be upon God's people who have the true gospel, the true God, and true worship, a calmness that is not deceived by what is going on in the world around us, which is a false gospel. That calmness, may God give it to us. This fire was not the fire of judgment, it wasn't the fire of excitement. This fire was the fire of the gospel. The gospel of salvation. Because that fire signified the acceptance of the sacrifice. Get the picture here. The people are rebellious. The people are worshiping a false god. Surely they deserve God's judgment. And instead of God judging them by pouring fire and consuming them, he pours fire on an innocent substitute. The sacrifice on the altar of the Lord is consumed instead of the guilty people. That's the gospel. God gives these prophets of Baal. He gives the people of Israel who are rebellious and obstinate and hard-hearted and stiff-necked. He gives them mercy and grace when they don't deserve it. See, that's what grace is. Whatever you don't deserve, instead of the bad, you get the good. That's the grace. And that's what God does on that altar. It's sheer mercy. The guilty people should have been consumed, but they are spared by grace. Because exactly the same would happen. God's altar called the cross where an innocent substitute would be sacrificed, would be consumed in our place, regardless of how we have wandered away, regardless of how stubborn we are, regardless of how against God's will we live, whether it be secret or whether it be in the open, that sacrifice was accepted by God in your and my place. And God is ready to declare us perfect in spite of it all. That's the gospel. And the fire in the last days, how it's going to be manifested, who knows. But it's going to be all over the world where the false gospel is going to be consumed, going to be absorbing people. And they will think that this is God's great blessing of, of acceptance on them. But it cannot be because altar occurred at Calvary. And the Bible says it's a once-for-all sacrifice. It cannot be done again. So if you see fire coming down to an altar, that's not God's altar. The sacrifice has already been made and accepted once for all. It's done. All that remained. All that remained 
was for people to respond to the true gospel, reject the false. The true God, reject the false. True worship, false. I want you to know, friends, that the true God and true worship and the true gospel always go together. You neglect one, you cut one out, you try and have a, a, a worship that doesn't fit in with the true God and the true gospel, you've got problems. That's why our worship must be saturated with the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Hence that bulletin that you have. The people responded. When all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground, cried out. You tell me what they cried out. The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. And God got a lift out of that worship service that day. Whenever you worship to lift Jesus up, you are involved in the true gospel and true worship and the true God. Here's the guarantee. If you respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ that is, is purely taught in the scriptures and not as it is taught popularly. If you gather here to worship God so that he will get most out of the worship service by lifting up Jesus... Every one of your deepest needs, as well as all the other possible needs you have, will be met in God's way, in God's time, and you will leave satisfied. Let's continue to glorify God. Yes, we will glorify. Let's sing it together, the song that Edwin will lead us through, and let it be our true worship. Our God.